So I'm going to present on um, youth peace building, uh, the youth peace and security agenda. Um, and the reason I titled my presentation Building Peace Through the Cracks is because of uh, the lack of or limited formal, formal engagements of young people in peace building. So it's really making use of the opportunities or the cracks that come up in either institutional processes or um, engagements that we have on, on peace and security. So we're going to move to the next slide, please. Um, I am here representing the African Union's Youth for Peace Africa program. And to explain to you maybe why uh, a senior member is not representing the African Union and I am. In 2018 in Lagos, Nigeria, um, under the African Union's peace, uh, Political Affairs, Peace and Security Department, which is commonly known as uh, PUPS, the African Union launched a program that's called Youth for Peace Africa program. And this program seeks to effectively engage, to collaborate, and also involve young people when it comes to peace and security on the African continent. And this came about as a request of the Peace and Security Council of the African Union. So the council set and requested the African Union Commission to appoint five young people to represent the youth peace builders in the different regions. So I'm here in capacity of uh, the representative of the Southern Africa region. And I have four other colleagues who represent um, East Africa. And for the Eastern Africa region, the ambassadorship went to uh, Tanzania. So Diana Paul Chando is the representative of the Eastern Africa region. We have for uh, North Africa, it was um, Hulud Baguri. She's from Tunisia and she's representing the North Africa region. And for uh, for Central Africa, we have um, Christiana Chaleke, who's from uh, Cameroon. And finally, for West Africa, we have uh, Mohamed Kunta from Sierra Leone. And I'll be happy to share with you these names because the reason I'm saying is so that when you go back home, you will know who your point of contact is when it comes to youth peace and security. So in a nutshell, this is, these are the representative or the five young people that the African Union came up with. It was a rigorous selection process. I think with uh, over 2000 applications, they shortlisted to 100 people and to finally 15 people, three people per region, and then finally one person for the region. So, so I worked hard to be here. <laughs> uh, can I have the next slide, please? So now that I've um, explained why I am here, um, I'm going to look at some of the institutional reforms of the African Union. I've read quite a number of publications that say, no, this is an old boys club, you know, that there are no reforms, and uh, to an extent that is correct. But in the past five years, the African Union has made some changes, including establishing the Office of the Youth Envoy, who was part of this program, I believe, last year. So the Youth Envoy is officially the representative of young people in the chairperson's office, and she deals with a number of issues, including education, um, youth participation in uh, development, investment, so it's, it's quite a broader mandate. And then we come in specifically on the youth peace and security agenda. But not only the establishment of the um, Office of the Youth Envoy, which um, actually the first one was from Tunisia, Aya Chebi, and the current one is from uh, the Republic of Zimbabwe, Chidom Pemba. Um, apart from, um, and hopefully, so so with these institutional reforms, uh, we, we look forward at the end of this year to having another um, youth envoy who will be from, from a different region because um, it has to be circulatory. So we can't have, let's say, someone from Southern Africa twice before we have other regions. So, so those are some of the changes the organization has made. And in addition to that, this year, the African Union appointed um, a specific head of state. So the Republic of uh, Burundi's excellence, Evariste Ndaishimye, is the point of contact when it comes to um, youth champions within the, the African Union. Because there are differences between the African Union, which is the, um, the heads of states or our presidents, and then the commission, which is led by uh, His Excellency Musa Faki and sort of serves as a secretariat or runs the day-to-day the -day activities. So among the heads of states, then we have the president of Burundi being the, the champion for the youth peace and security agenda. And this came about after the, after the continental dialogue on youth peace and security, which was held in Burundi last year in Bujumbura. And after that conference, there was the decision that every year the African Union should hold a conference that focuses on youth, peace, and security 
and brings together different um, actors from different parts of the region. So those are some of the institutional reforms that we have had. And hopefully I've, I've explained for those that are wondering why um, a young person is representing the African Union and not a, not a senior member. Now, can I have the next slide, please? So with uh, most other religion or even governments, we have the book, be it the Constitution, the Bible, the Quran. So the same applies with the Youth Peace and Security Agenda. We have guiding frameworks. And the guiding frameworks of the Youth Peace and Security, at the global level, we have what we call the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2250 of, 20, uh, of 2015. Now, this document was unanimously adopted. And the reason I uh, emboldened um, unanimously is because no state opposed to having the youth peace and security agenda framework, which means that states are increasingly realizing or appreciating the role that um, youth play when it comes to peace and security. After 2015, there was the United Nations Resolution 2419. And what, it, um, what this resolution speaks to, um, with 2250, it recognizes that youth can participate and contribute to peace building. But with 2419, it actually encourages the consultation and full participation of young people in peace building. So um, 2419 moves from just recognition to actually saying we need to fully engage and consult young people when it comes to peace building. So these are the two um, global frameworks that we have, and they apply whether you're in an African context, in Asia, um, here in America or even in Europe. So these are global frameworks. Now, when it comes to the African Union, the African Youth Charter, which guides the decisions or de um, engagements with youth people, with young people, Article 7 of this, 17 of this charter speaks to youth's role in peace building or in peace and security. So that's the African Youth Charter. But it was only in 2020 that um, the continent then had a a framework on youth peace and security. And this framework speaks to five key priority areas, such as protection. And um, the priority area and protection looks at young people that are already victims of um, violence or conflicts in the African context. It also speaks about prevention. And this is sort of proactive. We're looking at um, either engaging young people so that they are, they are not vulnerable to to issues around violent extremisms or insurgency groups. Um, the continental framework also focuses on partnership, partnerships and coordination. And that comes from the realization that we need different stakeholders to be able to contribute to, to this agenda. And it also speaks about dis disarmament, disengagement, and rehabilitation. So this one specifically focuses on uh, rehabilitating young people that are either part of um, insurgents groups that are child soldiers and bringing back into our societies. The fifth one, I, I can't remember off it, but at least I've done four, which is which is not too bad. So those are the, the priority areas of the African Union's um, continental framework on youth peace and security, and it's supported by a 10-year implementation plan. So this has got um, some of the milestones that we want to achieve between uh, 2020 and 2019, 2029 rather, including um, the establishment of national action plans on youth peace and security. So states should be able to articulate and say, this is how we're going to engage young people in our context. So these are the four frameworks that we have, and I'm going to be asking you questions based on this. So I hope you are taking notes. May I please have the next slide? All right, so I think um, what I've done in, in the first minutes was to just lay the foundation, but these are the questions that uh, Dr. Amebo wants me to address. So I think he's, he's now relieved that I've gotten into, into the specific questions. And one of the qu questions that I got was, what are security challenges faced by young people in Africa? Now, um, we've spent one week already engaging on some of the um, security um, challenges, such as unemployment, um, you know, lack of inclusion of or limited inclusion of young people in decision making institutions like our parliaments. But I'll leave my colleague Edmund to share more information when it comes to, to the security challenges. Um, especially focusing on the case of Ghana. But what I want to highlight is that traditionally we understood security challenges as national challenges. 
um, or challenges that a specific country has. But what they've turned out to be is actually global challenges with national manifestations. And when I say these are global challenges with national manifestations, it means that there are challenges that are evident in different countries. It only takes triggers for them to be um, sort of accentuated in, in several contexts. I'll give the example of um, in Europe, we've had uh, Fridays for Future or the school strike uh, on Fridays where young people are not going to school because they feel you know, the government is not doing enough to address climate change. So already we see sort of this shift from formal participation um, to, to uh, strikes and, and other sort of alternative or invented spaces where young people are participating. And this is a, this is a campaign that's led by uh, Greta Thunberg. If some of you remember her, she addressed the United Nations um, some, some two years ago. So that's in the European context. Here in the US and in the African diaspora recently, we had the Black, Black Lives Matter movement. Now, even though you know the outputs or the methodologies with which this was done, I think it's still a reflection in terms of this um, continent of, of people, particularly shifting away from formal spaces of participation into the invented spaces. And um, for Nigeria's case, I've got two examples. And the first being NSAs. NSAS was the protest against police brutality in Nigeria. And this led, um, I think, a lot of young people engaging to say, no, we cannot have, you know, the police force being used to, to meet out, you know, violence and injustices against the people of Nigeria. But what the youth of Nigeria also managed to do was to run another campaign, which was called Not Too Young to Run. So now, the Not Too Young to Run campaign was much earlier, and it actually saw the reduction of the years that are um, required to run for political office because young people had campaigned for that, and, and that was one of the movements. So we see, again, this shift from formal spaces of participation into the sort of invented, you create your own space where you lobby. Now, what is common to um, Not Too Young to Run, to NSAS, to Black Lives Matter is... Um, the campaigns against security sector actors. And I think that's majority of us that are that are here today. It's the institutions that the state interacts with um, and the people. So I think I, I found that interesting that there's actually NSAS and um, Black Lives Matter was specifically against uh, police brutality. And also what is common to these two um, protests is the issue of social media. Um, Black Lives Matter got support not just from the United States, but across the African continent and even beyond. So the role, again, that the African diaspora plays in terms of sort of um, bringing to light some of the uh, security challenges. And the same with NSAS. I, I remember in South Africa, when when we saw the images, we, we quickly um, tweeted to, to sort of be in, sol in solidarity with with the people in Nigeria, so so that was common. But so overall, and I think in Tunisia in, in 2011, we speak about the Yasmin Revolution, which also had a lot of young people that were unemployed protesting. So it goes back to, to the issues of saying that these are not just, um, you know, national challenges, but really global challenges with, with national manifestations. And in cases where they have a trigger, then we see them, you know, coming to light. May I have the next slide, please? All right, so we've established the, some of the challenges at, at a more global um, context, but what we have also need to appreciate is that um, governments and institutions alike have um, created programs or are starting to increasingly engage young people. And, and that's something to note. But um, I want to read the first part of the statement, which has been the rational justification that has been used to engage young people. And it says, youth constitute a large part of the African population. In countries such as the Gambia, they make 40% of the population. If we do not create employment for young people, they will become targets for insurgent groups and extremist groups, we should be inclusive. Now I see Dr. Mebo here nodding, but how many of us agree with this statement? If you agree that this is this is a correct statement. Okay, good. Now I'm going to read the a similar statement, but substitute young people with men. Now, men constitute a large part of the African population. In some countries, men make up to 60% of the population. If we do not create employment for men, 
they will become targets of insurgent and extremist groups, we should include men. How does that sound? Right. Now imagine if I'm trying to get you a job and I say, ah, I think Niger needs a job. Niger is part of a big population. And if we don't include her, she'll become a target. Already whoever I need to get a job from will think what is the basis on which I should provide employment for this person. So, and, and I just needed us to, to think about this in terms of the advocacy or the arguments we make when we're making a case for young people's participation. So let's go to the next slide. And I think this slide will show us how to actually make a case for young people. And I have uh, taken here a screenshot or a snapshot of the Benin Investment Conference in 2021. These are two young persons that are part of, um, you know, the e-drone campaign that is run in Benin. We spoke earlier about using drone technology in ensuring or enhancing our security sector um, services. And these are young people that are actively participating in creating drones. And this is done in Africa. So hopefully the next time you make a case for young people, whether on the African continent or beyond, you actually speak to, to the skills and capacities that young people have, because what that does is that it shifts the mentality from just let's include, include them because they're a big part of the population to what skills are they bringing to the table. And I think once we start having conversations about skills, about experiences, then we see how we develop each other. But if we only make a case for numbers, then the next time we have a demographic shift, we're going to shift from young people and say, no, actually now Africa has more women than it has youth. So let's make the case for youth. But if we look at skills, then we actually look at the value that, that people bring. If I have a million dollars today and I want to invest it in someone, I will not invest it in someone simply because they're a young person and I am a young person myself. I will not invest it in someone simply because they're an African and I am an African myself but it will be based on the skills and return on investment because as an investor, I want output. So focusing then the conversation regarding the skills that young people have, will then look at the sort of contributions, meaningful contributions that young people have to peace and security just beyond um, issues around numbers and population. May I have the next slide, please? So we've actually, these are some of the examples that I have of young people that are engaging in peace building efforts. We have Ilwad Elman from, uh, who runs the Elman Peace and Human Rights Center in Mogadishu, Somalia. And because of uh, Somalia's context, um, her efforts focus mostly on DDR, which is disarmament, disengagement, and rehabilitation of young people that have already um, engaged in conflict. And at the age of 28 years, um, Ilwad got nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. So this shows you that young people are actually active and it's not just a case of numbers. In Zimbabwe, we have the, we have the 4-H um, Zimbabwe Foundation, which uses sports to encourage people to live peacefully. And those that are very familiar with the Zimbabwean context, the issues around post-electoral and pre-electoral violence. So having sports which brings together people, even in this room, if we were to, to play Real Madrid and Manchester here, you find that people start to engage, even people that had not talked, because sports is really a big part of our, of our livelihoods. So, and that's what these young people have done, to use sports such as soccer matches to bring together different people so that they can, first of all, engage in peace and security issues and then, you know, play sports. And uh, 4-H Zimbabwe was nominated for the Monaco Peace Award in France and they won it last year in 2022. Um, in Cameroon, we have the local youth corner, which has over 600 projects. And this is led by my colleague, Christiana Chaleke, who's the youth ambassador for Central Africa. And um, Loyok, as they call it, the local youth corner in Cameroon supports, um, you know, victims of uh, um, ex oh, extremist offenders, rather, and also children that are affected by Boko Haram. And Loyok won the regional African Union's Regional Peace Award for Central Africa for the work that they do in engaging, um, you know, victims of um, extremist activities and also children affected by um, Boko Haram. We also have on one of the readings for those that um, cared to read the required material for this session, uh, we had the, the reading by Peter Jack from ACSS 
who has got a study on um, youth engaging uh, on peace efforts. And one of the examples he gives in that reading is Wrestling for Peace Initiative in South Sudan. So again, we see young people taking the cultural activities or cultural practices that are already within that context and using them for peace building. So Wrestling for Peace Initiative in South Sudan is one of the examples. And then in addition to that, we have um, the Youth Peace and Security Networks which of which I am in charge of one, which is for Southern Africa, we're engaged with nearly over 230 young people that are engaging in peace building efforts. And what we managed to do during my tenure was to create country chapters to realize that, okay, Southern Africa has got this group for the region, but what Botswana faces is not the same as what South Africa faces, it's not the same as what Zimbabwe or Zambia or Angola or Mozambique faces. So we created then um, country chapters where we then focus even narrow down to um, country specific challenges that um, that youth face. So from these examples, I think we can realize that youth are not only active, they're innovative, and they have lived experiences themselves, which if we tap into, they could really inform our peace and security responses. And may I please have the next slide. Now, in addition to the examples that I gave of young people um, engaging in, in peace building, we also need to base this on statistics and facts and evidence or research. And so it's not just a matter of maybe one of you might argue that, you know, the person in Cameroon got lucky and got resources and they're engaging in peace building or the person in Somalia, this was established by, by someone else. But what does the research and evidence say? And um, this speaks again to issues that I mentioned about the return on investment. When we speak about young people, we need to think of them in terms of the skills that they bring to the table, in terms of their innovativeness and um, lived experience. So return on investment helps us to understand the value and also helps us to understand why we need to invest in young people. And the um, USAID or the United States Agency for International Development and Search for Common Ground actually have a project that is called the Social Return on Investment. And they did a study in Kenya. And from this study, um, some of their findings, just based on the Kenyan context, was that for every $1 that is invested in youth and community members, there's an up to 5 or $10 investment return. So this shows you how long you know some of the investments go if you actually directly invest um, in young people. And most of them don't need high offices to operate from. If you give them the funding, they're able to, to run even from the structures that they have without needing to, um, to have a big office. Um, but despite that, uh, we have, we still have limited representation of young people in peace building. A lot of them now, uh, move from even decision-making um, statistics by Afrobarometer show that youth are twice as likely to have skipped voting uh, in national elections compared to middle-aged people, which is 19%, and those um, in the, the older citizens, which is 14%. So again, that shift from formal participation because either they don't see themselves represented or because of the other issues. Can I have the next slide, please? So some of you might say, okay, you've given us these examples where young people are already doing the work, where, you know, they seem to be making progress. What is the challenge when it comes to peace building? Because I have limited time left, I'll quickly just go through the list and then um, maybe we could engage after the session. But one of the key challenges when it comes to youth peace building um, is limited financial resources. There's still preference for more established organizations, yet many, um, there was a study of 399 youth-led organizations that were surveyed, and many of them operate with less than $5,000 a, uh, a year. And these are people that are making impact. So still limited financial resources available to them. There's also lack of coordination among stakeholders. So in some cases, you find the Office of the Resident Coordinator having a youth initiative, UN Women having a youth initiative, another UN organ having a, a youth initiative. And if those resources are put together, we could actually, you know, have greater impact than having us operate in silos. And the same applies to, to original context. Um, the other examples that I gave when I mentioned when I started off this presentation is the limited space 
informal peace building capacities. So what I call the cracks. So young people, if you find them engaged in formal peace building, then it's usually through these um, cracks or various opportunities. And then again, the limited evidence in terms of research, nobody's actually, or, or research is so limited when it comes to the actual potential or inputs of young people. And also limited awareness as we move to the next slide. Uh, limited awareness, some people actually don't even know that they can contribute to the youth peace and security agenda. Uh, some young people think it's the role of the military, some think it's the role of the police or the role of the government. So that brings us to one of the questions that I get uh, quite often, which is a very popular question. What is the African Union doing about this? And everybody that thinks their country has a problem is very keen to ask me, so what is the AU doing about this? Um, and I said, first thing first, what is my country or government doing to domesticize the regional international frameworks in youth peace and security? And the reason I focus on country or national initiatives is that the AU is, is a gathering or a union of our different states. So if your country is not doing their part at the national level, you're rest assured that the reflection at the continental level are not that different because the AU is made up of our countries. So we need to focus on national initiatives, but not only that, we also have regional mechanisms such as COMESA for East and Southern Africa, ECOWAS for West Africa, ECAS, uh, a community of South um, states were censored for, for North Africa region. So also I think engaging with these regional um, mechanisms will help us to, to, to have re uh, responses that are more specific to a region than actually trying to get things done at the continental level. Next slide, please. All right, so what is the African Union doing about this. The African Union has started what we call national action plans on youth peace and security. What these are are really sort of an articulation of what a country will do to engage their youth, focusing specifically on youth challenges that are faced in those countries. So national action plans on youth peace and security. I've got this book here and some chocolate from Ghana. And I want somebody who is quick, very quick because we have limited um, time left to tell me how many countries in Africa have got a national action plan on youth peace and security? Does anyone know, want to take a guess? How many countries in Africa have got a national action plan on youth peace and security? How many? How many? Seven? Can I get another answer from this side? How many countries have a national action plan? Okay. <laughs> um, the good news is I'm taking my book back to South Africa and my chocolate. So only two countries have a national action plan, and those countries are Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Countries including Kenya, Zimbabwe, Cameroon, Burundi, and Tunisia have started the process and are engaging on um, developing national action plans but only Nigeria and the DRC have national action plans. So I think it's also a point back to you when you go back to your countries to also prompt the, the states or governments to actually start engaging on developing national action plans because we, we, we unanimously agreed, I think in reference to UN 2250, that we need to engage young people. May I have the next slide, please? Okay. Um, this also speaks to the question that I have. I think we only have two slides left from here. But the question that I had, which was on security sector actors and advancing the youth peace and security agenda, because I could have given recommendations to say, we need to improve the rule of law, we need to improve accountability, our institutions. But many of us here are actually security sector actors. So what can you do to advance the youth peace and security agenda? And the first is in the first week we learned about mega trends, we need to adopt a multi-sectoral uh, approach when it comes to national strategies. And we hope to count on your support when you go back um, to actually bring to light some of the you know, mega trends that we have and actually the importance of having a multi-sectoral uh, approach. Um, the second recommendation is be available and accessible. I've engaged with um, African military two times, and the two times I've engaged with, 
the military was actually on American soil. So, so that, that, that actually um, tells us some of the trends. When we go back home, it's easy to engage here and discuss security issues. But when we go back home to engage the Department of Defense as a challenge, it becomes very inaccessible when there are meetings, you know. So I think please show up at youth peace and security meetings. Now, we don't expect everybody from the military to be there, but if you have a community engagement program, send a representative. It will mean a lot to, to the young people in the programs that we have to say, actually, the Department of Ministry of Defense was uh, part of my program. Um, apart from that, we've also seen, um, I think, military re-imaging efforts in our communities. Um, for example, the cleanup campaigns and cases of crisis coming in to assist, which is commendable. But we also need to move from, you know, this assistance perspective to actually meaningful engagement where we sit like this and actually discuss policy with security sector actors. Because um, as, as they like to call it, young people are woke. That's, that's what, that's the terminology they use. So they're able to tell when there's tokenism. They can tell when we're at the end of a program at a conference. So when we move to meaningful intergenerational engagement, then we feel, okay, I actually do have a role to play when it comes to peace and security. So we need um, consultations and strategic planning and programming as well. And then help us to see your institutions in different light. May I have the next slide, please? And when I say help us to see your institutions in different light, um, a lot of us, this is what we think of security sector actors. And it's not based on something we take from somewhere. It's because these are lived experiences. This is how some of us engage. I will not say which country this is, but these are some of the, you know, the ways in which we engage or we see our mothers or our aunts or our parents uh, when it comes to, to, you know, security. So it already creates a barrier when it now comes to community engagement because, um, you know, these are some of the challenges that we have. Now, it might be a big task to ask you to go and change your departments. Otherwise, you might get dismissed and I can't count on your partnership. But if there is just a little, I think, little initiative that you can bring in in your department, then be able to do that so that we can count on changing things. Sometimes it doesn't have to be, you know, a grand initiative or a grand plan, but just little change that you can implement in your department so that people get to see institutions in different light. Um, please move to the next slide. And in line with institutions, I'll share um, a very quick example. Um, when I, I was in Somaliland or Somalia for those who prefer last year in June, and I met, that was the first time I met somebody from the ACSS. And when we spoke about my work with the African Union Peace Building, they said to me, you know, we have a program at ACSS, but it focuses on mid to senior level experts. It doesn't focus on young people. And these are institutions. But she said to me, but I hope the new leadership of ACSS will consider engaging young people for this program. And I am here today. And that shows you that, yes, institutions are made in a certain way, but institutions require people that make them relevant, that make them inclusive, and that make them fit for purpose. So if you can go back to your department or to your ministry and just make that slight change, I think it would be of benefit to people. Now, to finalize my presentation, we were at the Martin Luther King Memorial this weekend, and this is one of my favorite quotes, which says, those who love peace must learn to organize as effectively as those who love war. And that just means that we need to be strategic. We need to work together from the different sectors in order to resolve um, some of the challenges we have. Um, in Africa, there's a um, proverb that says, when brothers fight, it is a stranger who stands to inherit their land. And that's the same thing. We need to be able to hold hands. Otherwise, winning the war on terrorism or other security threats that we have will become a challenge. And this, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Gale Buha, Amidase, Asante Sana.